All right, so how big can a guitar-like instrument really get? And did you know that music from the Renaissance and Baroque periods was more like a jazz lead sheet than what we would think of as a contemporary music score? Well, I recently had the incredible Brendan Aker as a guest on Tone Base Live. He is a multi-instrumentalist, early music expert, and a highly successful YouTuber. And we talked about this. In fact, he busted out five instruments from his personal collection to show me. Let's take a look inside. Welcome to another Tone Base live stream. Hello everybody, my name is Mircha. I am a professional classical guitarist and also Tone Base instructor and streamer. Recently, I had Brendan Aker as a guest on Tone Base Live, whom some of you might know from YouTube. He has quite the following here. This video was brought to you by Tone Base Live, where we do four to five live streams every week with some of the guitar's most inspiring names and incredible musicians. In addition, we also do solo workshops for technique and musicianship and even virtual masterclasses, which is a kind of format where you can send in your own video of performance and we can give you some tailor-made advice and feedback. Please do go and check it out. You can start a free two week trial at the link below. And if you do so, you'll be able to access every live stream we've ever done, as well as submit your own videos for virtual masterclasses. All right, so back to the video, Brendan showed us five instruments from his personal collection or petting zoo of instruments as he calls it. And he not only answered user questions about them and explained a little bit about the cultural and historical context in which they arose, but he also played all five of them for us. We started with the Renaissance guitar, the oldest ancestor. This is the Renaissance guitar. It existed in the Renaissance period of music. Uh, and it's really its heyday was in the 1500s. It existed alongside the, the Renaissance lute, and you can tell it's small. <laughs> it's it's itty bitty, and uh, it really looks kind of like a ukulele, in fact. Um, and you might be surprised to find out that the tuning. No. <laughs> Should we call it the Renaissance ukulele instead? It's kind of the same thing, you know. I mean, it's the, apparently I've I've heard. I don't know if this is true. I've heard that. Some Portuguese person uh, in the 19th century took a Renaissance guitar uh, to Hawaii, and that's what eventually turned into the ukulele. Um, wow. So this might be the ancestor of the guitar and the ukulele, in fact. Uh, so maybe that's where it, where it splits. Yes. Would you say that the Renaissance guitar was used a lot for strumming rather than um, uh, solo performance? Uh, both. Uh, okay. It's a really good strumming instrument, and it's a really good... Uh, puntillado instrument, plucking instrument. And the same thing is true with the bro guitar that I'll right. we'll talk about uh, in a minute. The, they, they were good at both. And in ensemble playing, when you're playing with a group, um, strumming is definitely the main thing you're going to do. And you'll hear that the strumming on this thing sounds actually really good. It's very bright, it's very loud. And my last Renaissance concert uh, was a concert uh, in, uh, well, uh, a touring a little bit, and it was with a group of really loud winds and drums and things. And I have to say that with all the instruments going on, this thing <laughs> cut through like everything, you know, that brightness wow. is so uh, percussive and uh, the timbre being a bit brighter and the sound in general is so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's such a fast response that it, it really cuts. So in an ensemble, it's really good as a rhythm guitar instrument. By the way, you know how your teacher probably forced you to learn standard notation if you ever got real professional music lessons? Well, let's hear Brendan's opinion about that. I guess this opens up the conversation now about notation, which is what, the second you become an early plucked instrument player, whether you're playing on a, you know, a classical guitar or the, or the actual instruments, uh, I really want to suggest to everybody watching that you should start to learn tab. Uh, it's where we most of us started anyway, and as we know, it's very intuitive and clever, and it was the dominant style of notation for plucked instruments for most of their existence. They're directly printed uh, with the, with the usually with the uh, composer's you know guidance, and there's a lot of information here that you wouldn't get in a modern edition for guitar. For example. Um, 
let's take a look at the, all these dots. What's going on with these dots placed next to these notes? Uh, these one dot under a note means pluck with the index finger. Two dots right. means pluck with the middle. By default, the first ones are usually plucked with the thumb. And of course, when you have a chord, uh, you have to either pluck them all together or arpeggiate or strum. And then now above, we have rhythms. Um, right. And one thing you can notice from from those dots is it's usually every other note. So when you have a right. full measure of da da di da da da, usually it's it's pluck in the, with index uh, second. It's every every other note essentially. So the measure you're looking at now would be so strum index index p i p i. And this p i p i technique was a really great uh, invention uh, in the 16th century or maybe even earlier, which came from plectrum technique um, on, the, on the medieval uh, lute. And so right. this is actually a super fast way of playing. Uh, it just flies like you're playing with a pick. And right. so you play down with the thumb and then up with the index finger, which creates strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. And you use a bit of the arm, and you also put the pinky down on top of the instrument. And if I play a bit of this piece, you'll you'll hear that, and it's uh, it's a really nice uh, galliard. PI alternation technique is so elegant, and it's, uh, we'll, we'll run into that again when we get into the, the Renaissance lute. Um, but in general, that's the sound of the, of the Renaissance guitar. And it, again, it was used in solo repertoire, but as well as, as chamber music, uh, played in different, different ensembles. All right, so that was the Renaissance guitar. But if you dabble in early instruments, the much more common version of the guitar you will encounter is this next instrument the Baroque guitar. See, now uh, we have a Baroque guitar. Not Baroque, but a Baroque. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, this is a Baroque guitar. Uh, this was the dominant style of guitar in the 17th and early 18th centuries. Uh, and you can see it's like the Renaissance guitar and it has the hourglass shape still, um, but we've now gotten bigger uh, in size, in scale length, and we've also added a course. So a course is a pair of strings, remember? So that was a four course instrument. Now we've added a fifth course. Um, in this case, now it's an, it's an A. And so now we have something that's very close to the modern guitar tuning. A, D, G, E, E. Wow. It's almost a guitar, but you don't have the low, the low E. And otherwise, your guitar chords are the same. You could play nice. a bunch of guitar songs on here, and it, it's, it's the same. And then probably the, the thing that we didn't talk about before, but is really difference, if you were to pick this up, is the fact that the frets are the same material as the strings. They're made of gut. Right. So they're, I tie them around myself, uh, and uh, you can, which is cool because you can uh, change the size to adjust your action. So right. if you have a buzzy note, you just put on it, you just cut that fret off and put a different size on, uh, and that you don't have to go to a luthier to refret your instrument or file your frets or anything yeah. like that. Um, it's very customizable. That's that's amazing. Hey, did you know that in German, the word for fret is bunt, even for a modern guitar, bunt. And bunt yeah. actually means bound, as in bound together. And hey. so I tell my students when I talk about this, when I teach them about the bünde, the frets on the guitar, I tell them that they are called bounded because they used to be bound on with nice. actual gut. So, yeah. That's Naturally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, being a vampire, of course, you've uh, learned a lot of languages. And as it turns out, there is another advantage to having bound frets. You can change their position and pitch between pieces. Temperaments are, were something that was really common on early plot instruments and used a lot in the Renaissance and Baroque periods. 
And what you do is you, you favor certain pitches, and uh, by doing that, you can play more in tune in certain keys. Mainly, uh, in, for example, in equal temperament, the major thirds are quite yeah. sharp. So they actually are pretty unpleasant. I mean, they can sound a bit like a... Let's see if I can actually make that sound like a major third and equal. Something like that. Right. Which is not exactly in tune, but we're so used to it that we think, well, that's what a major third sounds like. But what happens if you take that note and you bring it down? Now it's yeah. pure. It sounds like a fourth, you know? Um, so the idea of tempering the pitches uh, allows you to play certain chords and keys uh, more, uh, more in tune than you otherwise, uh, otherwise could. Um, so the frets are actually a big advantage, and I wouldn't put metal frets on these if, even if I could, because that's, that's right. such a cool perk. So interestingly, despite what we might claim in the modern guitar world, the Baroque guitar was an instrument that really excelled at strumming above all. It's so incredible coming from the classical guitar. If you've ever played a bit of flamenco, it feels like proto-flamenco, you know? I mean, their right hand techniques are so sophisticated and so advanced. My, my favorite strum is called a rapico. And what you do is you, you rotate your arm. It's very different than any flamenco strum I've seen by rotating the forearm like this and keeping your middle finger and uh, thumb kind of fixed. You, and you, you hit the middle and then the thumb and then the thumb in the middle. So and just rotating the forearm. And if you do that fast enough, you can get this barrage of 16th notes. So you can do things like... for such a good strumming sound and it's so fast and actually easy once you nice. get the technique down and there's just so many of those so as you can hear it's a very percussive instrument and now a lower tuned than the renaissance guitar so when i play in baroque operas or i play in chamber music like i just did a concert of vivaldi having that strumming uh for the intense uh vivace movements are just it's, it's a really great great sound and if you thought that strumming pattern sounded like what you would expect a flamenco guitarist to do, or perhaps a guitarist accompanying a singer through a fiery passage, wait till you hear what Brendan has to say about playing Baroque music in general. You're expected to memorize these and be able to just improvise on end. Uh, and, to, and you know, you get together with some experienced Baroque players and uh, you can just improvise uh, <laughs> as long as you want. Um, yeah. It's part of, you know, it, there's something that has to switch in your mind to play Baroque music, and that is you have to acknowledge that you are now a composer, improviser, and performer. There's no, there's none of these barriers that we learn when we major in music that I'm a performance major, or I'm a composition right. major. And those things don't exist. Those are modern ideas. And, and to, be a, uh, to be a Baroque person uh, playing music, you have to be able to improvise. And in fact, a lot of the music you hear is improvisatory in nature. And right. then the scores we have are just shorthand, and they, the composers really would have expected you to improvise over the top of those, to take part in the act of composition. So to just play what's written is to not actually, it's contrary to what we do a lot, a lot with uh, more modern music, we try right. to find, you know, to find what, what are the composer's intentions and yeah. not go outside that box. But in this music, the composer's intention was for you to take the reins and uh, add a lot of your own ideas. And if, you, if you're not doing that with lots of ornamentation and you know, even adding brand new variations and things like that, if you're not doing that, then we are not following the composer's intentions. So it's a very different uh, style of making music. It's like, imagine you have a lead sheet from the real book and you're playing jazz that's and you're literally totally. just playing the notes in the lead sheet. That's, that's not even playing the piece, really, right? It's so far away totally. from the intention of the, of the composer. So I thought I'd show you a little bit of what it is to play on the page, and then what it is to improvise uh, in this music. So if I was to play the first bit, you would get something like... And 
to improvise in this music is to take the ground. We talked about a folia before. This one yes. is a chaconne. And a chaconne is... Again, that, that jazz lead sheet. So how many different ways can you play this jazz lead sheet? opens up the music so to uh, the composer, so excuse me, the, the uh, performer, taking the composition and adding their own variations. So whenever I play this piece, um, whatever the music tells me, I usually play about twice as much music that's off the page. And that's right. such a cool thing, you know, to like feel like you really make the piece your own and not just play uh, what's on the page. All right, so these were two of the five instruments he showed us. And it's really a pity to cut this so short. You should really go to Tonebase, start a free trial, and check out the whole thing because there's so much more that he showed us and so many more passages that he played for us. It's just really worth watching the whole thing. But now, let's jump to some of the less European ancestors of the modern guitar. Because the guitar is not quite as European as some people might think at its origin. The, the oud is the, uh, the ancestor of the lute, the European lute. Um, and both the word lute and oud apparently derive from the word wood. Uh, and so this is a Turkish oud. Uh, and just to, so as we can understand the transition, they were usually teardrop or pear-shaped. Um, they have double strings. Right? Um, they're tuned in fourths with one major third. Uh, they have a round back with individual strips of wood called uh, ribs that are glued together to make the round back. A very cool bent backwards uh, headstock with, again, friction pegs. And sometimes they're pretty beautifully ornate as well. Um, the most, uh, the hardest thing to play uh, an oud from the guitarist's perspective is the fact that there are no frets. Um, so you have to memorize the positions. And again, I'm not a very good oud player, but so we can get the sound of an oud. Um, slippery sliding, uh, you know, ability now uh, to actually use the notes in between each semitone is very expressive and, and vocal. Um, so that's where a, a, something like this is what the oud was like around the 8th century when the Moors uh, invaded the Iberian Peninsula around the 8th century, bringing the oud with them. Now, the Europeans took the oud while they were occupied, and they they turned it into their own instrument, their own invention. But now the, the lute, you can see the similarities. They kept the teardrop shape, kind of a decoration in the sound hole, double strings, the round bowl back made up of strips of wood, the bent backwards peg box, friction pegs, all that. So it's very similar to the oud. And in fact, for hundreds of years in the medieval period, the medieval lute was uh, played with a plectrum in the angel's right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being it's, held it's at a massive. horizontal. Yeah, 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 and I have one here. I have, a, I made my own. It's made out of a gut string. So wow. you take a gut string and like a fourth course and you just make a curly cue on the end and then you hold it between your fingers. There's different ways to do it. You can hold it between your fingers like this. And then you use the end of the gut string, the same material as the strings, to then pluck. Oops, I'm fret out of whack here. 
so you can just play with a pick. <laughs> so wow. they did that for hundreds of years. But and then in the uh, when you get to the Renaissance, uh, is in the in the I think the fifteenth century, they dropped the pick in favor of using the fingers so that they could play polyphony. Uh, right. So many voices occurring simultaneously. Um, and so with a pick, you can kind of get one melody, or maybe even like you know uh, a drone. Um, which is, you know, there's two parts there, but you can't have independently moving parts uh, as easily. So in the Renaissance, it was very popular to do even like four part, you know, um, counterpoint with vocal right. pieces, especially. So lute players wanted to take part in this and begin even entabulating those vocal works. So they dropped that and they kept the position, which was this position of the pinky down and the thumb kind of inside the hand. We call this now thumb under. And so they were, did a lot of alternations like this. And right. it's a super fast technique, probably the fastest technique I know of to play scales. Um, and uh, a lot of music in the golden age of the lute, uh, especially in the 16th century, utilizes uh, this, this fast P and I alternation technique. And in, in the early stages of the lute, the thumb under was very popular. But uh, uh, before we go on, let's, let's hear actually a piece that uses this so, so I can show you what that sounds like. Sure. <laughs> and you see some paintings like in, in New York or in Chicago, um, you'll see a lot of lute paintings that look like this. And if you have this idea that the lute plays thumb under, you go, wait a minute, what's this guy doing? And all of a sudden you start to see a lot of paintings like this. Uh, in fact, there are inc an incredible amount of paintings that are played right on the bridge, even the pinky behind the bridge in this case. So right. often the pinky was put behind the bridge, in the, especially getting into the 17th century. So they're playing right on the bridge and they're playing thumb to the left of the fingers. So, um, in short, what happened apparently was that um, in the early, 16th, uh, early Renaissance, uh, people played with the thumb under position, but over time, as they added more and more bass strings, uh, lutes were usually even four and five courses only in the medieval period. By the, I think, the end of the 15th century, or maybe, the, maybe early 16th century, uh, they, six courses were common, six course lutes, so kind of like a guitar. But after, it, when you get closer to uh, the 17th century, they kept adding basses. So here's a sixth course lute. But then they added a seventh course. And then an eighth course. And then they added a ninth, and even a tenth in the Renaissance. Right. Um, and then the Baroque period, they just kept adding strings. Um, so they, wanted, they kept trying to increase the bass, bass register. But as they added more strings, they found out that this playing position was more ideal to get those basses. So they developed a thumb out technique by the end of the Renaissance. And so it's said even that Dowland, at the beginning of his life, played thumb in, and at the end played thumb out, because he played a 10 course. Right. So thumb out is a historical way of playing the lute. And uh, so we shouldn't be scared as guitarists to play thumb out. A lot of people do. Uh, and uh, even playing uh, classical guitar, guitar the same way for the lute, it's, it's totally a, a valid technique. Um, and I just would encourage guitarists to, to keep using the PI idea. So thumb out, you can still play PI and use the arm. And that'll help you get that strong, weak idea and play very fast, elegant scales. All right, so the lute is fine and dandy, but the question that I asked at the beginning of this video was, how big can a guitar-like instrument get? And I mean a real guitar-like instrument that existed, that was played, that is still being played today, not some sort of gimmick Guinness World Record-like thing. Well, that instrument is called a theorbo, and that is precisely what we looked at next. Theorbo is as tall as I am. Wow. Uh, six feet tall. And it is basically a giant giraffe guitar. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> now, because it's so long, um, a recent uh, luthier, the one guy who made this theorbo, uh, Klaus Jakobsen in London, he recently invented a mechanism that actually allowed it to fold in half, oh, which is yes. so great. 
because uh, I travel with it. You know, when you have to fly, put this on a plane, uh, most people have checked them in the past, but with the Foley mechanism, now it fits in a seat. They don't actually touch the fretboard. I don't fret these in my left hand. These are just plucked in the right. So those are the ones that can fold. So what you do is uh, you can take this little cylinder and you put it, oops, you put it through. And now I can take this little pin out uh, and that'll allow the bases to fold. And so here's the, here's the scary part. Wow. <laughs> so, right? And now they're folded. And so the strings are being bent around the cylinder. And the best thing is that they are staying at pitch. So that is have incredible. Half, which can go in that little case back there, smaller than a guitar case. And so there's the joint with my gut strings bent around the, the cylinder. And the best part is they, they're still in tune because they're at the same tension. That is incredible. So at, with all that happening, I'm still in tune. <laughs> and so now I, I come to the gig, I take my, my Theorbo out of this case, I undo the bases. I put this thing in so it can't collapse on me. I take this out. And now I have my, my Fjordbo again. Unbelievable. And so I thought, actually, that, that's the craziest part. <laughs> wow. And we're still in tune. All right, so that's all well and good, but why the hell is this instrument so big in the first place? What's going on there? The reason why this instrument is so big is because the strings are made of gut. And to make a gut string sound good at this pitch, you have to make it very, very long. So I have a secondary peg box up there, and then I have one here. So there's two separate peg boxes, um, that, and I have to stand up to tune <laughs> the, other, wow. the other strings. Um, yeah. This is, again, uh, French tablature. Uh, this is a prelude by Robert de Vizet. Uh, and here we have six lines for the top six strings, and then there are some letters or numbers underneath, uh, oh, kind yeah. of like ledger lines that are the bass notes. So that seven you're pointing to, that's the lowest string. And now the note before that is the G. Right here, now you scroll to the right with your mouse. And now these here, that's, that's, we have F, G, A, G, F, E, D. Those are the bass wow. notes there. And then above we have the, the fingerings of the left hand. A is open, B, C, D, E, F, all the way up. So that's how it works. And I know it looks like hieroglyphics when you first see it, but it's actually really intuitive and so great to play from. So let me show you how this prelude sounds. Yeah. Second from the last line, you see a six in the bass. I'm going to start from there now, just because to show you this cool end here, rapid scales. So that's the sound of the solo fiorbo in French Baroque music. And you can hear the bass range is so re rewarding and it frees up the thumb to do its own bass line while the fingers play on top. One of the next movements you can also watch, if you watch my right hand, this is a, this is a chaconne. You'll see that the thumb does something completely different than the left hand. Folks, this is what we got for you in today's highlights of Tonebase live video. I really encourage all of you to go to Tonebase and check out this live stream as well as all the other 
close to 200 live streams we have available for you there. All of them can be watched as a recording after the fact. And if you catch them live as a member, you can also ask your favorite artists your own questions. You can submit your videos for virtual masterclasses and really interact with these incredible personalities of the guitar world in a way that was not really possible before. So I hope to see a lot of you there. Uh, lots of really cool things are coming up. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching this entire video. Check out Brendan, uh, Brendan's channel. It's really incredible what he does. And uh, I hope to uh, see you again in the next live stream. I hope to work with Brendan again. And uh, I can't wait to see what uh, is going to be the next show. So please stay happy and healthy and uh, see you in the next highlights of life. <laughs>